Thank you very much. Um, I also thanks all of you for being here instead of being over at Maddie's, even though he's like DevOps famous. Thank you much for being here. Um, life after DevOps, I'd like to talk to you about sustaining engineering as a discipline uh, and how it can solve a few problems uh, that you may have in your organizations. Um, you can find me at tim at bonsi.net and these slides are up on SlideShare. Uh, I have three main points that I'd like to cover and then there's time all set aside for Q&A to answer any questions you might have. And if we get through all that, uh, I've got some bonus content where I'll go into the issues I still have and the problems I still haven't worked out here. So I'd like to talk to you about the software lifecycle, basic stuff. I'm sure you've all seen something like this. Um, for any given product, you plan, design, build, test, gather data, repeat. Um, I, this is probably not surprising to anyone here. Uh, I'm sure everyone's seen something like this. I personally don't like to use the, the arrows here because I know sometimes you go backwards, you're going concurrent many times, but this is very familiar to, to most of you, I'm sure. Uh, there's also the, uh, this software lifecycle that I'd like to uh, refer to, where you have a piece of software that starts off um, in concept, you prototype it, you do your alpha beta testing, uh, and then you do your release, at which point it live the customers. There's still some feature growth that happens, but once you get past your, your alpha beta releases, you now have a live piece, piece of software uh, that is in what I consider it's uh, the sustaining part of its, uh, of its life cycle. Um, that's gonna go through a supported phase. It'll eventually be deprecated and, and retired. Any piece of software that, that goes live uh, is going to have those steps that, that need to be covered. Uh, so. I break this up into two parts, the traditional development part, uh, up through your, your release, and then your sustaining part once it's live to customers and has to, has to remain live. So there are some complications that, that arise when real world situations uh, come into play. So uh, I've got a few of those. Names may have been changed to protect the innocent. Facts may be just fabricated, but uh, here are three common types of problems you might see. So. Uh, You've got uh, a team of two who build the bulk of a service, leave for different companies, leaving it in the hands of their, their squad mates. What do you do? Who, who's responsible for that service? Uh, you've got a problem on your hands. Uh, you've got uh, another team, two members build a thing, move on to new squads to meet new corporate priorities. There's a restructure, reorg, a lateral move, however. There's a third teammate who was there, uh, but was on leave for, for part of it who's responsible for that service at that point. You, you, you're in a bind, you've, you've got a problem. Uh, you've got your friends in the Butterbeer squad. They built four different products. As with most teams, there's been some membership changes, some join, some leave. Uh, there's only one left with a working knowledge of the two legacy products because cross-training was deprioritized. We always wanted to get to it. It was something that we, we knew was important, but it just never, never bumped up. It always, it always got pushed to, uh, to some point in the future. So now she's got a sweet job offer and what's gonna happen to those, those legacy products. So these are the problems that arise due to real world circumstances and I'm going to suggest sustaining engineering is something that we can use to, to solve this. So here's how sustaining engineering could look. Uh, I, I'm gonna talk about sustaining engineering as, as a discipline and also as a team and um, there's the, the DevOps mentality that I've heard a lot of times where you, you build it, you own it, it's yours for, forever. Uh, I think that that's, that's all nice and good, but I'm, I'm proposing something slightly different. DevOps is a methodology, a way we, we do things. It's, uh, it's, it's a culture about, about collaboration. It's not necessarily about a team, uh, and we don't necessarily need to, to maintain the connection between the team that built it and the team that, that sustains it. So when you have a service that, that needs to exist unchanged for the foreseeable future, uh, there's, um, there's work there that, that needs to be done. That's a distinct class of work that I call sustaining engineering. Um, but DevOps does not preclude that being done by a different team. The transfer of ownership from, from one group to another group is certainly advantageous under certain circumstances, such as the ones I laid out on the last slide. So, I'm gonna talk about sustaining engineering as a discipline and sustaining engineering as a team to keep the two uh, things separately. I'll be referring to the sustaining engineering team, the group of people, as the Purple Cross. So um, when you see that on a slide or you hear me say it, 
purple cross is going to refer to the group of people and not the discipline as a whole. Uh, so our purple cross team is going to start up describing them as a persistent group of engineers. They have a catalog of supported services. Uh, a little bit of humility here. These aren't my uh, ideas entirely. I didn't invent this stuff. Uh, I, I happen to do it and have some strong opinions about it. But we all kind of stand on the, the, the shoulders of those that came before us. So um, I'm actively trying to uh, make my team better and draw out thoughts from, uh, from you folks. So I'm happy to hear feedback uh, from you later during the, the question part. Um, so I don't have all the answers, um, but I will tell you what I do know. Um, sustaining engineering is something I first heard about about 10 years ago uh, from Microsoft. It's also something that's been used uh, a long time uh, in, in the defense um, industry uh, when they have a piece of hardware that is long lived and needs to be, to be maintained. They call that sustaining engineering. Um, I didn't bother to source either one of those claims, so there's a giant uh, grain of salt for you. Uh, staffing is super important to me. Uh, I think anytime you're designing a team, you need to, to understand what your staffing looks like. So I'm gonna talk about the type of people that we want to staff on our, on our Purple Cross team. Um, uh, we don't talk about staffing enough uh, as an industry, and I think it's super important that we uh, un understand what the challenges are, uh, what our de de definitions are, and how we, how we really see th these teams coming together as actual people um, that are more than uh, uh, just a sum whole. So there are two groups of people that, that I see as um, the, the ideal staff for our Purple Cross team. The first are our junior engineers. Um, these are people who uh, don't have a ton of experience and need to uh, still gain some exposure to, to different things. They're, they're gonna want to see something different every day. Uh, they're, they're gonna need to kind of build some expertise, see what they love, and find what they may want to specialize in. So sustaining engineering is a great place for your junior engineers to get that exposure to, to different concepts. Um, you, you'll be working on a networking problem one minute, then you're gonna jump to DNS, and after that, you're gonna have to figure out um, why this thing in the Linux kernel is doing this. So uh, all in one day, you're gonna have uh, a broad exposure to topics, and that's great for junior engineers. The next type of, uh, of staff that we need are your hardened badasses, the people who have seen some shit and know how to handle it. It's, it's the end of the world, but don't worry, we're gonna make it through this. Um, I've seen this before, so um, you also need your experienced engineers on the team. Uh, people who, um, who are gonna be able to operate well in a fast-paced environment and uh, for the critical things that, that they support uh, are not gonna be, be dragged underwater by them. So junior engineers, experienced engineers, I'm kind of saying there's a gap in the middle and that's okay. Uh, we don't necessarily need all of the engineers on this team to stay on this team for the, the entirety of their careers. The junior engineers will grow, they'll get some experience in things that they might enjoy, and they may go off to other teams. Um, just understanding that that's what your staffing looks like are, is gonna make you more successful at um, making sure that, that, you, that your team, your sustaining Purple Cross team is itself sustainable. You're gonna have a hiring and staffing plan, and you're gonna be able to get the right people in, and you're gonna be able to, to grow the right people out, and maybe bring them back in as your hardened badasses. Uh, so the Purple Cross team. Persistent team of engineers, staffed with a mix of junior and experienced. Uh, so this is who they are. Now, what, what is it they do? When people hear sustaining engineering, this is the thing I hear. Oh yeah, you guys fix bugs, right? Yes, absolutely, sustaining engineering fixes bugs. That's what, that's what everyone knows, but there's also a lot more that uh, sustaining engineering is about. Um, and particularly the things that are important and most valuable are the long-term architectural changes things that for any long-lived piece of software, any service, any product, um, there's gonna be things that, that you're gonna need to tweak. And not necessarily because someone made a bad decision early on in the process. It's not like someone decided that uh, we'll just deal with, okay, this database column is gonna grow at some point in, in seven years, it's gonna, you know, uh, it's gonna overflow and that'll be a problem we'll have to uh, handle down the road. That's not necessarily a bad decision you've made in the moment, saying we're gonna handle that in seven years is a perfectly reasonable decision. Uh, also things like your, your backups, your, your backup strategy for an active product that you're doing releases to multiple times a day, uh, your, your, backup, your backup strategy is gonna be much more aggressive, your disaster recovery strategy is gonna be different 
than it would be for a product that is going to sit with no intentional changes for a long period of time. Changing up how you handle your backups, how you handle your disaster recovery is absolutely something that needs to adjust once it moves to a sustaining model. Um, you also have things that, that crop up due to the nature of, of some systems changing, patches coming in uh, under your underlying architecture when your software isn't changing, all of a sudden you're getting deployment time creep, that's a problem that comes up, you just have to fix. Um, there are also uh, instance types are gonna get cheaper, you're gonna need to make sure that your, you know, your stuff was gonna work on the new EC2 stuff, you're gonna wanna move to the, um, to the, the more cost efficient stuff when it comes out. Uh, these are all, all things that need to be handled um, besides anything actually breaking. Uh, this is all stuff that you need engineers to be able to understand and fix. Um, also, you're going to want to eventually deprecate and retire some of these services. Not everything you build is going to live forever. Uh, some things you're going to say, okay, this validation service we needed at one point, but the things that, that relied on it have moved to, to something else. We now need to retire this. This stuff can, can die and go away, but you need an engineer to, to make that change because if you just have someone hit a button and not all of your de dependencies were, were in line, something breaks. So uh, you need engineers in, in charge of this stuff. So our sustaining engineering team, this is who they are, this is what they do. Resolving incidents, fixing bugs, long-term architectural health. Uh, I'd like to use a metaphor here of the wet basement. Um, sometimes when you have uh, a problem with the service, Stuff goes bad, all of a sudden there's water in the basement, people are gonna grab buckets, you gotta get that, that water out of there. But we actually have engineers uh, with a true engineering discipline in to handle these problems because sometimes just using buckets isn't efficient. You're gonna need to install a pump. And even if once you, you get all that water out of the basement, you're gonna need to figure out where did all that water come from? How do we keep it from happening again? We need to, to move from a mindset of just bailing water to installing pumps, figuring out where the water came from. Do we have aging plumbing that needs to be addressed? Uh, do we need to install a drain in the hill behind the house uh, so that we keep this water from, from coming in? These are all kind of engineering deci decisions that need to be made when incidents happen. So it's not just about, uh, okay, all the water's out, let's move on to the next problem. You need en engineers to understand these problems, make the long-term architectural changes uh, in order to keep these, these things happening. Topic the third, uh, once we've decided sustaining engineering is something that, that, that we want to do, how do we enable it? And once we've done that, what does this enable us as the business to do? Uh, I'd like to start first talking about transitioning as a service. Um, easiest thing I can say about this is this is not throwing something over the wall. Uh, like everything else in DevOps, this is around a conversation. This is different teams working for the same end goals. Uh, this is not something you're gonna take and say, yep, we're all done with this, this is yours now, have fun, great, thank you very much. Uh, when we're transitioning a service, there, there's gonna be uh, some, some concurrency going on and some, some back and forth about, is this healthy enough, do we have our documentation, et, et cetera. Uh, it's also not a second swing at the backlog. We, we have moved from the feature growth phase to the support, supported and sustaining phase. Uh, it's not about, okay, we're, we're done with this, this is now going to the, to the Bush Leagues to, to put in some of these, these last things. That's not what sustaining is about. Sustaining is about making sure these things last and these architectural changes uh, are made to keep these things lasting. What transitioning may be uh, is in alignment on business fundamentals. Let's talk about what it is this thing does. So any decisions that we make are aligned to, to the end goal. We're not gonna sustain a piece of technology for the sake of that technology lasting forever, that's not, um, that's not really useful to the business. If we know that the business needs an address validation service in order to, to get to these outcomes, and the sustaining team's job is to make sure that address validation service stays up, uh, to make sure those, those goals get met, then their job is to make sure those goals get met one way or another. Um, sometimes you can even combine services, deprecate one over, over another, say, hey, this other team actually built one of these, let's switch everything over to using that, and that's, that's the better decision. So we want to focus on what the actual business outcomes are. Sometimes this is also a, a tough conversation. You'll have some things that need to be transitioned that are not in a great state. Um, if you run into to one of these, yeah, we have this system, you need to take it, no one knows a thing about it, we don't have the passwords, good luck, here you go. 
Um, these can be tough conversations. Um, the solution there is sometimes you inherit the code, but not necessarily the architecture. You get it up and running elsewhere and make sure that you can, you can swap all the dependents over. Uh, the services that we like to transition, uh, there's a couple different patterns here that I'd like to talk about. Uh, lighthouses, uh, this is an analogy I like to use where you've got, you've got a product, it's super critical, needs to run every night. If it doesn't run, it's pretty bad. But luckily, it's very well automated. Uh, it's a simple system, so there's not a lot that can go wrong. If anyone here is a lighthouse expert, just tell me about it later, how I'm doing it wrong. But um, these things are critical and they're, they're simple. This is a great service to, to transition. Uh, this, this is the kind of thing that you, you hand to, to an engineering team. Here's your documentation. You're, you're, you're off of the races. You're good to go. Um, the other analogy, kind of on the other end of the spectrum, dogs. Everyone loves dogs. They're not necessarily business critical, but they make people happy. They, they deliver joy to the, the customers and employees that they use them. Um, they're sometimes finicky, but uh, overall, they're they're stuff that people like having around. They need daily care and feeding. Not necessarily a problem. Now, something we don't want to get handed off to us are puppies. Puppies are, are their services that don't have that business value baked in yet. And it's more like, hey, we just built this thing. We think it's kind of fun. The housebreaking should be in the next patch. Don't, don't worry about it. Uh, you know, the spaying fix is scheduled. So you know, uh, let's, let's get those puppies you know, matured into dogs before we, we go ahead and move them off to sustaining. Thank you very much. Um, th the reason that, that dogs, you, you might not think that that would be something that would be, be great to transition, da daily care and feeding, but the reason we do that is it scales really well. Uh, w what you need to put in place, like automation-wise, process-wise, to go from supporting zero dogs to one dog, yeah, that, that can be a bit of uh, an adjustment. Going from one dog to two dogs, almost nothing. Uh, you're gonna be able to apply those same procedures that same automation, and you, you can scale that up very well, a dozen or more dogs um, without, without really batting an, all, uh, an eye. So those services are gonna scale really well. Uh, so once you have your, your Purple Cross team in place, uh, what, what's that is gonna enable the business to do? You're, you're gonna be able to start building a culture uh, of sustaining. Uh, what I mean by that is, uh, the people that are going to want to start to transition the teams, the people that are building these technologies that are going to want to transition the products to the Purple Cross, um, you're going to put together documentation in a better way because you know that documentation is going to be read by someone else. That, that's not just, oh yeah, I need to know about the ham sandwich thing because I know what that means. You're going to write it for someone else to, uh, uh, to read. Um, also with the documentation, things need to be written down why those decisions were made, not just how they are made. Um, the, the whole uh, code as documentation thing doesn't really work when you're gonna hand it off to, to someone else because you don't always bake in all of your underlying assumptions. I can read through the code and know how this thing works. I can, I can trace through and, and understand it, but I don't understand why you made this decision here. It may look like a bug to me and I fix that and all of a sudden there's some business goal that's not being achieved because I didn't understand that. Um, that can be fixed uh, through a comprehensive test suite if you've got a good enough test suite that actually handles all of your business outcome cases uh, as well as all, all of your unit test integration tests. Uh, but the documentation really needs to, uh, to be built around a culture of sustaining where we understand why the decisions were made and what the, uh, what the business outcomes we're trying to achieve are. So something that also arises from this we get to a series of defaults. It's not, not necessarily governance, but once there's an understanding that we're gonna build this thing, we're gonna hand it off to, to other people, if the, the engineers that are building this thing know, all right, we've gotta put in some, some monitoring platform on this. It doesn't matter to us really which monitoring platform, it's an arbitrary de decision. If we know that the sustaining team prefers Sumo Logic and New Relic, if we don't have a good reason to use something different, we're gonna plug in Sumo, Sumo Logic and New Relic and we're, we're, we're good to go. We, we don't waste time making that decision. We don't, uh, we don't put in something else arbitrary that we then have to teach a new team how to use and your Purple Cross team has to end up supporting six different monitoring platforms. Uh, we can coalesce around a source of defaults 
without it really needing to be top-down mandated or some sort of governance board deciding, here's how we're gonna do everything. It's just about uh, creating a set of d defaults to, to answer those questions like, if I have to make an arbitrary decision, instead of going to Google for 15 minutes, you can go to one of the guys in the Purple Cross and say, what are you guys gonna prefer we use for, for our monitoring here? And it, it's easy enough to, to have that conversation. Uh, the holy grail here uh, is to take that conversation and have uh, those discussions around, um, uh, you know, what do you prefer to use and make sustainers actually a stakeholder and push those discussions left. Uh, if, if we can talk to, to the developers that are building things that they're gonna want to transition, uh, then we're gonna have time to actually say, uh, all right, you, you want to use a new monitoring platform because there are these things involved. We're gonna have time to train up on it. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna know uh, the intricacies of that, so when it comes time to transition, uh, we'll be ready for it, uh, and uh, we'll also be able to, to provide our inputs to say, okay, you, you wanna do it this way in, in AWS, we prefer to do it this way. If you don't have a good reason, let's, let's make sure we're, we're standardizing so that all of our automation just plugs right in. Um, so ideally, we would like to have those conversations as early as possible, but every stakeholder says that. So uh, again, this, this can be a little bit difficult. Uh, DevOps really wants to include everyone as early uh, in the discussions as possible, but uh, I understand sometimes that's not, that's not possible. But please, uh, if you're gonna adopt sustaining, try and have those conversations as early as possible. So uh, now I've come to the point where uh, I've got time for some Q&A. Um, so if you have questions, I'd uh, be happy to, to field them for you. Um, while someone comes out here maybe with a microphone to see if there's questions. Uh, these are the, the takeaways that I'd like you to, to focus on for this. Uh, if there's engineering involved, there will be sustaining engineering. Any service that goes live to customers is going to have those, uh, those tasks that just need to happen, those long-term architect architectural changes. Either the team that built the thing is gonna do it, or you're gonna pass it off to another team. But that's engineering that has to happen. And involve is sustaining as stakeholders early, is gonna allow your business to function more, more efficiently. So what questions do you guys have? Uh, have you had any luck trying to uh, integrate, say, remote teams uh, as a uh, sustaining engineering platform? Uh, it feels like a softball. We actually, at Vistaprint, um, our, our sustaining engineering team is split between Waltham and Barcelona already. So um, that, that has worked well, but we also have um, different development squads that are positioned around the world, so it's just part of our culture already. Um, if it weren't part of the culture, it may be a little bit different, so um, it, it may be harder if that's your use case, but for us, uh, it's, it's a natural fit, and it certainly works. Hi. Uh, it obviously makes sense, in my experience, as an engineer, why you would need sustaining engineering. It, it's obviously a very 100% business need, but how do you make it attractive? That's one of the things that I would argue as like, it, it, it's there, it's a given, everybody mm -hmm. knows, but how do you make it attractive? Because like, if I was told like, oh, we're gonna put you on the sustaining engineering team, I would almost be like, oh, what am I gonna learn new here? I guess it's gonna try and look at it as a really positive thing, but. Okay, so, so you're saying attractive for people wanting to work on the team? Yeah, so if you need business? to attract that talent, like you're saying, yeah. you wanna build that team, Okay. You, you, you want to attract, obviously, some good people, so sure. how do you make that attractive? Yeah, uh, if, if I can go back to the, the staffing plan, your, your, your junior engineers are, are gonna have exposure to a lot of different things. They aren't gonna be, uh, they aren't gonna go onto a team where they're gonna be heads down working on de debugging Java all day, every day. They're, they're gonna be able to, to be exposed to a lot of different things and see a lot of what, what's out there. So it's a good place to kind of get your feet wet and get some exposure to uh, to a lot of different things that actually happen in production systems. Uh, from the experienced engineer side of things, we're, we're looking for the, the type of person that is, uh, who are looking for a fast paced environment, who are looking for something different every day. Uh, it's, it's not a fit for every experienced engineer for sure, um, but there are some, some tough architectural challenges that, that need to happen on, on aging systems uh, that can attract some people. Um, so it's a great place for, for probably most junior, junior engineers it's a great place for some experienced engineers who are looking specifically for, um, for some different things. So that there, there are people who, who want to be able to jump around, work on this, make this change, jump over this, this thing, make this change, jump over this thing, make this change. So it, it's, uh, it's kind of a personality thing. 
um, that, that we look for in the experienced engineers. All right, so, so the question was, what's the difference between this mechanism and a tr traditional operations team? Um, in this case, the sustaining engineers, uh, the, the sustaining engineering team, your, your purple cross, is actually in charge of the code underlying it. Uh, there's no one to, uh, you, you don't say, okay, we found a defect and hand it back to someone to fix. You say, we found a defect, we're gonna break this thing open, we're gonna fix it, we're gonna make it better, we're, we're gonna change the entire platform underneath it, we don't need to ask anyone's permission because we own it. Does that make sense? Great. I think we're at time. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, if anyone else wants to provide feedback, there's a uh, four o'clock open space that was unclaimed, so I'll be talking about sustaining there. Anyone else wants to talk about it more? Thank you very much.